Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Senate Education on uh, Wednesday afternoon, January 27th. Uh, we are going to spend uh, today looking at S-16, which is an act relating to the creation of the School Discipline Advisory Committee. We have a number of witnesses, uh, but we're going to start with the lead sponsor, uh, Senator Sears, the senior senator from Bennington. Thank Great you, Senator. Senator Campion, thank you very much. Um, well, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. And uh, it's nice to be in the Education Committee Zoom room. Yeah. Um, we just thought if, if you would uh, like, as usual, uh, you know, I, I know quite a bit about this work uh, through you and you filling me in over the years um, through. Uh, but you, but it's please a continuation go Continuation of work to understand school discipline and the use of expulsion and suspension. Um, over the years, uh, there have been many studies done, mainly one in Texas that looked at the school to prison pipeline and found an extremely um, unfortunate um, the correlation between school suspension and expulsion and uh, school and uh, prison time, and particularly in minority groups. And as we're, you know, as I've met with people, particularly uh, around the country, uh, that study was done by the Justice Center, Council of State Governments Justice Center. Um, and uh, being a member of the board, we heard an awful lot about the study as it was getting put together and everything. and. Uh, look particularly at Harris County, which is uh, Houston, I believe, Texas. Um, you know, I, my first boss said to me, you know, you first have to recognize you have a problem before you can solve the problem and get to the problem. So I think admitting we have a problem uh, is goal number one of this bill. And that is gathering data regarding um, school discipline and race and, race and ethics ethnicity um, and other factors that go into it. And then hopefully that data would guide policies on how we deal with school discipline. Um, but uh, you know, I, I dealt for about 40 years with kids who didn't like to go to school. And they had a variety of reasons. Many of them were extremely intelligent, but many of them uh, would prefer to get suspended when they could go out and basically do whatever they wanted. There was nobody at home to tell them what to do. And uh, they, they would prefer that to an in-school suspension, for example. Um, many would prefer an expulsion, um, get me out of this school. So I, I think we have a long history, um, but it's time to uh, get some hard facts and data behind Vermont's um, uh, expulsion and suspension and then to try to develop policy based upon what we find out. Great, uh, thank you. And we, we can um, find that CSG study through you, Senator Sears? Yeah, although you can go on the Council of State Governments Justice Center and look at um, the various papers that they've put together and you'll, you'll find uh, various studies on school discipline and, and um, matters regarding juvenile justice. And then if you would like, I can, uh, you know, I can't, the, the gentleman who did the study is no longer with the Justice Center, but um, they have uh, people who work exclusively in juvenile justice and we can get you some names. And stuff. I think my only question is, this you've you and I entered this bill in the past. We've we've had these conversations. Yeah. Historically, what's been the holdup? You know. Well, um, no, I I I'm not sure. I think it's been the other body, but um, okay. but it's also been the education establishment, frankly. Okay. Um, 
You know, and I, I started my program down in Bennington in 1971. And the school system was more than happy to provide us money <clears throat> back then in order to educate the kids away from the high school. They would have preferred they not be in the high school. Mm -hmm. I think there are kids that our education um, institutions would prefer to not be there. Uh, that's pretty blunt, I know, um, but I think that's true today. Questions for Senator Sears. Uh, please, Senator Chindon. Uh, Senator Sears, thank you for this bill. And uh, I, I love measuring things. I have a phrase, and of course, I teach at UVM, you can't improve what you don't measure, and what you measure matters. And I see a lot of this is just trying to get accurate data. Uh, the questions I have are from a, a new senator perspective. I, I just wonder if the counts, and you have so much experience, you could probably tell me what your rationale is on the creation of the council being uh, in consultation with the commissioner of corrections and of public safety. It's unclear to me where this council would really live uh, and how it would exist. Are there other councils of similar composition and charge, or is it better to put this, uh, the oversight of this council more clearly and specifically under a state agency? That's a great question and I'm not sure I'm prepared to answer it, but I think you're getting in the right direction. I mean, the reason for the uh, Department of Public Safety and the Department of Corrections is, is the school to prison pipeline. Um, that's the basic reason, but I certainly think the committee is, uh, I would more than welcome the committee looking at other uh, folks that should be looking at this, perhaps DCF too. Um, now, at one time, the largest high school in the state of Vermont was the Community High School of Vermont operated by the Department of Corrections. I have one follow up, if I may. Yes. Uh, so I also, we also heard from Senator, uh, not Senator, uh, Secretary French yesterday about a part of his budget or plans is to try to unify some of the back office information systems used in schools across the state you see a fit for not, not tasking the commissioners of corrections to collect this data, but maybe charging Secretary French to employ more consistency in tracking this data and part of those efforts to standardize some of the back office systems that we use in our public schools in the state? I, I, don't, I think they could be done in concert. I, I, we need the data to understand if there's bias in these decisions, if there's uh, implicit, I should say implicit bias, if there are um, certain groups of kids. I mean, a, a few years ago, Senator Campion and I introduced a bill to try to introduce alternative justice into school discipline, such as, um, you know, after school programs, uh, you know, making, um, making restitution through apologizing to the victim of bullying, for example, and having kids deal with that rather than expelling or suspending them, having them deal with, with what they actually did and how they can make it right. And restorative justice is such an important tool in our uh, justice system. I think uh, school, many schools have instituted restorative justice. I know Mount Anthony and Bennington has. And um, I think they're quite successful with it. And anything that Secretary French could do to make that um, generally available around the state would be, I think, helpful. Other questions? Senator Sears, thank you very much for- well, Thank you, Senator, and thanks for taking this up. Appreciate Absolutely. it. And I'll, I'll see you at five o'clock press conference with the banner. Yeah, no, actually, I was gonna say, if you would like some help with the Justice Center and I can see what, you know, what they have, um, on that study, but I, I can, uh, it Actually, was, that would be terrific. Uh, I think Jim may be familiar with it. I think, um, he may have seen it years ago, years ago. Yeah. If you want to, Jim, uh, is that something you can collaborate with, uh, Senator Sears on? Oh, I'm not familiar with it, but I'll, uh, I'll talk to Senator Sears. Yeah. I'll try to send you a link to it. Let me look on my, um, on the Justice Center website. Okay. Okay, great, thank you. Yep. Thanks. Thank you, bye now. Thanks, Senator Sears. See ya. See you later. Okay. 
Mr. Demaray, are you ready? I am ready. Um, Thanks for being with us. Uh, if you would take us through the bill, uh, sure. a bit about what it does and how it plans to do it, that would be great. Okay. I'm, I've been having trouble with screen sharing today, so let me just see what's going on with it now. But do you, am I able to screen share? Let's see. Um, uh, Jeannie? Yes, Jim's a co-host, he can share. Okay, let me see if it works. Uh, okay. Perfect. Can you see this, Bill? Great, okay, good. Super, uh, let me minimize this, okay. Okay, so um, for the record, uh, Jim Damer, that's console. We're walking through S16. Um, it starts with a number of findings, which I won't read through, um, but there are two themes in these findings. First is a theme around the fact that exclusion, um, the suspension or, um, uh, or, or being uh, kicked out of school, uh, both of those um, fall unevenly onto marginalized groups. The first thing is that there's some stats around, around that issue. Um, um, so that's one theme here. And um, the second theme, so you have down here on, on page uh, two, um, black students, for example, uh, their suspension rates um, are higher, et cetera. So there's, there's data, data on that. And then secondly, um, the other theme here is around lack of data. So it uh, points out that um, that un under seven here, data is largely unavailable in Vermont or incomplete. And that's what leads to this um, uh, full language around collecting data. So we have a better starting place to deal with this issue. Those are the two themes here. Um, I would say that these findings came out of language that was drafted back in maybe 2018. So uh, they ha this has not been updated, and maybe through testimony we'll find that some of this could be brought uh, more current. Uh, but right now it's, it is what it is, and um, it lists out um, some earlier dates here, like this one here, 2013-14. Uh, so maybe we could update that. Um, Section two is the heart of this bill. Um, so this creates the School Discipline Advisory Council, which as mentioned, um, uh, works in consultation with the commissioners of corrections and public safety. And it's, its job is to collect and analyze data uh, regarding school discipline in Vermont public and approved independent schools uh, in order to inform uh, planning, planning and uh, decision making, etc. The membership uh, is 15 individuals. Um, we've got um, the secretary, uh, the commissioner for children and families, uh, defender general, uh, the uh, executive director of the state's attorneys and sheriffs association, uh, a superintendent uh, accepted by the Vermont Superintendents Association. Uh, two principals, two teachers, and two special ed teachers um, in six, seven, and eight. Principals are selected by the Vermont Principals Association. Teachers are selected by the Vermont NEA and the special education teachers by the Vermont Council of Special Education Administrators. Um, and then you've got the executive director of the Vermont Human Rights Commission the executive director of Vermont Legal Aid, of Vermont Legal Aid uh, and two parents uh, of students who have received an out of school suspension um, in a Vermont public or approved independent school, set by the Secretary of Education. Uh, the powers and duties of the council are to first analyze current data collection definitions and practices used in Vermont for misconduct and for dis disciplinary actions that result in a student's exclusion from the classroom and develop standard definitions and practices 
um, for, for the collection of all appropriate data related to school discipline. Second is to analyze annually on a school district basis, the available data regarding suspensions and expulsions, um, and identify, collect, and analyze this data um, as necessary to inform the work of the council, including uh, the number of instances of expulsions and suspensions in each grade operated by the district, the total number of students in each grade operated by the district who were expelled or suspended, and the number of instances of expulsion and suspension or both for each student. Um, the duration of each instance of expulsion and, and expulsion and suspension. The infraction for which each, each expulsion and suspension was imposed. And lastly, e, each instance of referral to law enforcement authorities or the juvenile justice system. Um, the third function is to identify strategies including unnecessary legislative changes, which the schools can develop to develop in school solutions to disciplinary issues uh, and to ensure that student access is not impaired as a result. Um, and lastly, it's, it's a function to share insights and best practices to Vermont educators, um, school administrators, policymakers, et cetera. This council, going back up here, just a note, is not, this is not session law. This is a new statute. So this is designed to be a permanent council uh, going forward. Um, and um, I noticed in that regard that um, this reporting needs to be changed here. This says one report, but since this is a permanent council, it should be an annual report It'll be uh, on January 15th. Uh, to the House and Senate Committees on Education uh, and uh, Judiciary, um, Human Services, and Health and Welfare uh, with its findings and recommendations. The meeting, uh, first meeting would be by September 1st of this year. Uh, this is all standard language about how it runs meetings. It should not meet more than six times, I would say, per year. That should be added here. Um, and get support from um, the Agency of Education. Compensation is standard, uh, compensation for um, members. And then um, section three um, requires the secretary before the first meeting of the council to collect and distribute to members of the council all, all readily available data, data on suspensions and expulsions. Uh, for the academic years 2013 through 2019. And then, um, Secretary, uh, on before July 1 of next year, uh, we incorporate the council's definitions and practices uh, that they develop um, into their data collection rules and procedures uh, to the extent permitted by privacy laws. Um, and the effective date is on passage. Okay, um, questions? Senator Shindon. Sorry to dominate the floor today. I'm just really glad to see Secretary French here. As I, as I read this, it seems to make a lot of sense, but I, I wonder if it's gonna get assistance from the Department of, a, of Education, the Agency of Education, and if the Agency of Education Secretary is the one that has to follow through on all this, is this the right structure in charge? Or as you highlighted, Jim, it seems like the language seems to have been temporal or task force oriented with a singular report and not an annualized report. And I'm wondering if we need to rethink the structure and placement of this so that it's more permanent and maybe that fits better as just a charge to the agency of education. But I'm the new guy and I'm gonna keep saying that for another month or so. And I'd love to hear Secretary French's reaction to the structure of this bill. Sure, and we're gonna have Secretary French in just a little bit. Uh, but Jim, did you wanna add anything at this point before we move through our witnesses? Uh not much. I just want to say that, as I mentioned, this being a, a permanent console, um, some of the changes have to be made in terms of reporting. You could make this a temporary console uh, for a couple of years. I mean, that's your choice. But right now, it's trained as being a permanent and statute console. Senator Persley? Yes, I just need to 
switch between the screens here. Uh, when we talk about a public school uh, in section three, line nine, does that automatically mean independent, approved independent schools? Or would we, if we wanted to include those, would we have to say that? Or are they captured by public school? Since they get- uh, they're, they are not captured by public schools. So um, when you're referring to an approved independent school, that has to be separately mentioned. Okay. Something to consider later. Thank you. Yeah, just following up on that, when Senator Sears introduced it, or perhaps it was when you did, Jim, are independent schools part of this? They are. So oh. I'm looking at page four. So the um, the charge of the console is to um, affect and analyze that, et cetera, regarding school discipline in Vermont public and approved independent schools. So it's covering both. Senator Perchel, did you have a follow up? Well, yeah, that's that's why it stood out to me that we didn't list them in this data collection part. I'll go back to you and see, especially in some places, maybe not others, I'll check and see. Okay. Senator Terenzini. Uh, thank you, Senator Campion. And you can tell me my comments are premature if they are, uh, as I'm reading over the bill here. Um, the one, the one part that I don't quite understand, and hopefully some of our testimony today can clarify for me, is the under Section Two, when it talks about creation, it talks about the uh, uh, creation of this council in consultation with the commissioners of correction and public safety. I'm not really seeing yet, in my opinion, the value of uh, asking those department heads or commissioners to get involved in this to me it seems still like an education uh sort of uh, lane to travel in but maybe um i'll get a better explanation uh later i understand the statistics uh are that eventually some of these students unfortunately do end up in the uh, corrections uh system and so on but not understanding that portion so i'm, I'm hoping to find out some answers i guess on that great and uh as we're going through this uh you know, we're taking a, a heavy look at it today, but if there are people that, if we continue on this path uh, next week, um, if there's anyone in particular, uh, particularly, you know, just let us know that you wanna hear from, and we can certainly hear from that agency and that commission itself. Senator Lyons, are you looking for your unmute button or? <laughs> I was finding my note page. <laughs> Uh, no, I don't have questions. I'm okay. waiting to hear the testimony, but, um, you know, I'm always hearing concerns from school folks about the, oh, the burden of um, human services and needs in school systems and how um, uh, this is not, uh, this is what I hear, this is not what I believe that teachers are um, overwhelmed with having to deal with all kinds of human service issues. And, so, and as I look at this council, I guess I wanna hear more about that perspective from folks as they testify. But then I'm also interested in, um, I guess, what is the purpose of the council? Is it for prevention? Is it to improve school culture? Um, so, and so for me, there's a, a little edge to the council, and I guess it might relate to the comment that was just made about having um, corrections involved. So, I, I just like to see how this all sort of sugars off as we hear testimony. Yeah, it's a good point. Anything else for uh, Mr. Demaray before we move on? Okay, uh, Mr. Demery, are you able to stay with us a little bit as we make our way through witnesses? I uh, am. Yeah. Terrific, all right, well, we're glad to have you. And with that, um, I believe uh, Susanna Davis is with us. Uh, Ms. Davis, how are you? I am well, how are you? I'm fine. Uh, I think last I saw you, in person was at Bennington College on an evening that we had a really great 
lively conversation. Uh, and thanks for being with us today to weigh in on this bill. Um, and I think this may be one of hopefully several times that we'll partner with you and look to you this year as we make our way through a number of different educational uh, bills and fronts. One of the things uh, we are started talking about a little bit about last week, which I know um, we'll engage you on is civic education. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, but for today, we are talking about this school discipline council and uh, S16. So if you don't mind, just introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about your role. Um, and then if you would be so kind as to respond to the bill. Great. Um, Buenas tardes, everybody. I'm Susana Davis, the executive director of racial equity for the state of Vermont. This is a role that was created by act of the legislature in 2018. I was appointed at the very, very end of July. No, rather, I began at the very, very end of July 2019. So I've been here for about a year and a half. And this role is housed in the agency of administration. So I work very closely with Secretary Young. Um, but the work is very much statewide. And so there's a lot of collaboration with uh, other agencies, everything from public safety to education. I see Secretary French here, and I'm so glad to, to be on the call with him, um, and, and a lot of other agencies and departments as well. The statutory um, duties outlined for this role include conducting a top to bottom org review of all three branches of state government to identify systemic racism, mm -hmm. uh, overseeing the statewide collection of race data, developing performance targets and metrics, developing and conducting trainings for all state agencies, Etc. So those are some of the things that we are doing. Um, and I was very pleased to be invited to this hearing to discuss S16 because I think there's a lot of confluence between this bill and some of the goals that we had been thinking about for schools in Vermont. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, there are a lot of committees, commissions, task forces that exist that touch on equity in some form, not just racial equity, of course, but equity for the LGBTQIA plus community, people living with disabilities, people experiencing poverty and homelessness, et cetera. Uh, one of those committees is a task force called the Racial Equity Task Force. It was created by executive order last summer. I chair that task force. And one of the things that we were asked to look at over the last six-ish months, was um, systems of support that exist for communities of color in Vermont, generally speaking. Um, the task force issued two reports. One of them is already public, and uh, I can share that with, actually, I think I shared that with the committee um, earlier this week. And in that first report that we issued in September, one of the findings that we held was that school discipline, particularly the oppressive disciplinary tactics, have a disparate impact on a lot of vulnerable students, which includes students of color. And so um, very broadly, the task force made a series of recommendations about this that I will talk about momentarily. All that is to say that um, between the work of that task force, the work of the Act One group, uh, which I also sit on, and, and a number of other committees, the harassment, hazing, bullying, there's been a lot of attention placed on schools, school behavior, and how we deal with that behavior. Um, a number of you may also be aware of a sort of slate of equity related um, legislative proposals that have come from the administration, one of which is to do something very similar to what this bill is calling for, that is to create a body um, that's going to help figure out how we can um, minimize oppressive disciplinary tactics and maximize uh, in school services. So I will say very generally, I am in support of the goal of this bill and in support of the work that it aims to do. And I, I come here with just a few questions and a little bit of food for thought for you all as you deliberate. Uh, first, I noticed that there is a strong emphasis here on having ties with the law enforcement community. One of the things that we discovered in our findings on the Racial Equity Task Force was that minimizing student contact with law enforcement was absolutely key to uh, interrupting the school to prison pipeline and to preserving the social and emotional and mental health of students, especially those who live in communities or are part of demographic groups that are already over-policed. So we're talking about students of color, we're talking about low-income students, et cetera. 
So that said, um, I do think that if we're considering creating a body like this, that we either that we reconsider how much partnership happens with law enforcement, not to say law enforcement shouldn't be involved, but that I don't think they are the partners who should be primary um, to, to this group's work. I would instead invite us to consider additional or alternative partners, such as those in the mental health arena, those in the arts, believe it or not, because many of some, some of the most effective interventions uh, when it comes to student behavior and discipline have to do with alternatives that engage students in other ways, like in the creative sector. So I would encourage us to consider having partners who represent uh, the same areas that we want to divert students to. I'm thinking about, um, and I, I don't remember where this was, but I remember reading a few months ago that, that there was a school somewhere in America that had created a, a meditation room for, for their students who were um, misbehaving in class and that it was very successful in that district. And so thinking about if these are the sort of diversionary tactics or alternative um, methods that we want to use, let's engage professionals from those spaces because it'll make us more likely to do that successfully. So that was one thing I wanted to say. Uh, it's a lot of law enforcement there and we may want to reconsider. Another is um, I noticed the heavy focus on data here and that's so important, especially for work like mine. We, uh, I am often asked, hey, do we have data on race related to such and such? And it is often the case that we don't or that we do, but it's insufficient or that we do, but it's statistically insignificant because of low numbers. And I recognize that when it comes to the student population, we're up against certain federal privacy uh, protections as well and state laws. So um, keeping all of that in mind, I, I very much support the collection and the analysis of data. And more importantly, what I really want to encourage us is to make sure that we're doing something with it once we have it. Because there are data already uh, in Vermont that tell us that there are disparities in school discipline. For example, the um, Commission, oh goodness, I'm going to get the name wrong, but the United States Commission on Civil Rights, the Vermont affiliate of that commission issued a report, I think last December, that details the disparities in discipline for Vermont students of color, students living with disabilities, students with IEPs, et cetera. So, um, you know, between them, between HRC, between Act One, between a number of entities, we do have data. So I, I don't want to discourage the further aggregation and reporting and, and, uh, and analysis of those data, but I do just want to make sure that we're putting, that we're, we're backloading, maybe not backloading, but that we're not focusing uh, more of our attention on the collection and analysis, but rather that we're focusing more of our attention on action steps in response to those data. Um, and then I suppose the last thing that I, I really wanted to highlight here um, was that we should be prepared to invest, um, which ties into the point that I just made, right? It's about, it's about what we do once we have the data, and it's about how we reform our system. And so um, I think that we're thinking, we might be thinking about the immediate cost of the formation of this body, and we might find that it's low cost or no cost to form this, this committee, or perhaps minimal cost when we consider administrative support, et cetera. But the recommendations that come out of this committee could be pivotal for Vermont students, especially those in historically marginalized groups. So as we consider the initial work of impaneling this committee, and perhaps their continued work, if it is a long-term committee, I just wanna make sure that when we do this, that we're not just committing to creating another body, but that we're committing to tangibly investing in the interventions that come out of this body's work. That's going to be really key. And, and I suppose while I have the floor, um, what, what popped into my mind is another, another thing that I often mention to folks, which is that when you ask for uh, input from historically marginalized communities, or from uh, people who tend to be underrepresented, oftentimes you will hear suggestions that might strike you as radical. And it's just so important that we recognize that the standard should not be where, we're, where we are, but rather where we could go. Um, and so as we think about how we do things today versus what are some of the recommendations that we might be hearing in the future, I just want to make sure that we're all keeping in mind that our anchor shouldn't just be how we do things now, 
but rather where can our imaginations take us? Um, and I'm thinking about specifically, I'm thinking about um, something as simple as like breakfast in school, which um, back in the day was, was considered radical because of who was proposing it, of course, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. Um, but once we saw the impact on students, on their nutritional health, on their family wellness, on their academic outcomes, the fact that it reduced aggression and punishment in schools, the fact that it fostered better learning, et cetera, once we saw those undeniable numbers, then suddenly breakfast in schools was no longer a Black Panther Party for Self-Defense thing. It, be, it really came onto the radar of um, public nutrition, public health, public schools, and suddenly it wasn't radical anymore. Now it's considered basic and necessary. And so as we continue in this work, I want just to remind us that one, we should be prepared for the down the line investments that we're called to make. And two, that we should keep in mind um, that those um, those recommendations may may not be what we're accustomed to, but may absolutely um, move the needle for students in Vermont. So before I ramble for too long, I'm gonna stop there. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Uh Committee questions, and if you don't mind, I'm just going to kick it off with, do you, around the data, do you believe that we already have enough data out there to start to be making some of the changes, or, or is there indeed um, more data be, to be collected? Because I, I think I, the answer. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, I, I was just going to say I think the answer is both. Okay. We certainly have enough, we certainly have enough to know that there are disparities and to identify the student groups experiencing those disparities. Um, and we are also in some ways limited by lack of data or lack of ability to report them publicly. Mm -hmm. So there's there's always work that we could do to expand the data collection and analysis, but I think that we still already have enough to be able to act on. Um, and, and something I should have mentioned earlier is it, you know it isn't just about the students experiencing the disparities but also about those who are on staff or faculty who may or may not be empowered um, to, to weigh in on, on certain disciplinary decisions, especially if the faculties are not reflective of the diversity of the student population. So um, for example, we, data show us time and time again that when faculty mirror demographically the student population, um, faculty tends to have higher expectations of students, they think um, more critically about students, they they think twice before recommending more punitive um, measures. So really ending, or I shouldn't say ending, but um, improving our school discipline structure is, is going to have to do both with policies um, that we're implementing, but also in who it is who's implementing and enforcing those policies. So I think those data on, on, um, on diversity, not just for students and for faculty, are also should be contributing to um, to the body of data we have. Thank you. Questions? Uh, terrific. Um, thank you. Please feel free to stick around uh, if you have time. Uh, you can always watch this also at a convenient hour since everything is now on YouTube. Um, and. Uh, We'll leave it there for now, but likely we'll have you back to continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you all. Secretary French. Good afternoon, how are you? Doing well, how are you? Not too bad, thank you. Would you uh, yes, like so, to- uh, You've heard uh, some testimony so far, appreciate you being here. Uh, if you would share your thoughts on S16. Yes, I uh, thank you for the opportunity, Dan French, Secretary of Education. Um, I submitted a written outline of my comments uh, earlier today, so hopefully the committee has access to that. Um, and I appreciate the conversation around data. I think that would be my first point. Um, the, uh, you know, we have a construct and statute already about uh, data collection, and that really stems um, from the Secretary's authority. Uh, so I think, you know, firstly, the issue in terms of process of how to collect the data, I'd make the observation that um, it's more effective, I think, to use an existing process and authority uh, to collect data as opposed to, um, you know, creating a separate body to do that because ultimately the agency is going to be involved in, in making that happen anyway. Um, and we would prefer um, to be directly involved because that's essentially how the system is configured. 
Um, and secondly, I just, you know, the issue around data quality, which um, is an issue, uh, always is an issue. Uh, as a system, we've made some improvements on that in the last couple of years, primarily uh, through the implementation of what's called the state longitudinal data system. Essentially what that means is uh, for al almost all the data collections that we do with school districts, those are uh, automated processes. So districts have student school information systems in which they enter data and then they export data from those systems to uh, the state system. So it's gonna be important um, if we are implementing another um, a data collection process here that we work within that overall system, uh, meaning that we have uh, a standard of data collection and process that conforms to what we already know and do, because uh, that will greatly assist uh, with uh, addressing the issue of data quality. Um, to the earlier comment, I think for Senator Campion, your question to Susanna about um, do we have the data, do we not have the data? Um, you know, we can always have more data. I think, you know, we certainly, uh, I, can, I can describe uh, the data that we do have largely in this area stems from federal requirements. So the school districts themselves report directly to the federal government in what's called a civil rights data collection. And then we have a separate federal data collection that comes to the agency, what's called a combined incident report, uh, which is essentially number of students suspended, how many of them were on IEPs, that kind of thing. But we, we haven't uh, really ventured down the path of um, asking Vermont questions of our system and creating Vermont data collection. So I think that's an opportunity and something we look forward to doing. Um, but as we do that, it's important that we understand that there is a sort of a federal standard for data uh, that we use, uh, what we call the common education uh, data standards. Um, so there are all the data elements have been defined uh, that are in this bill uh, in sort of a federal data dictionary. So we would just wanna ensure uh, that whatever we do in terms of a data collection would conform to that standard, once again, to improve data quality and to ensure the data can be collected and so forth. But I would just- uh, I could just interrupt there for one moment. Sure. Uh, so just to clarify, when we collect data right now, it's, it's in a structure or it's in a format that is um, in sort of compliance with how the feds are asking us to collect data? For the most part, the data collections we do ask school districts to do are directly as a federal requirement. Okay. And when you say we don't collect data for, you know, Vermont specific, so for example, can you give us an example of what you mean by that? Yeah, for example, um, there's been a question that's emerged from debate in the General Assembly around, I'll use pre-K as an example, mm -hmm. and to what extent pre-K, you know, uh, are there pre-K deserts, you know, um, are, you know, to what extent is pre-K unequal from region to region, to what extent is pre-K center-based versus home-based, um, and we don't necessarily have that data until we, we, we listen to those questions and design a system. So to give you an example of how that was resolved, um, each, uh, the Agency of Education is what's called a state education agency or an SEA. Each state obviously has an SEA. And we're grouped together and we have a comprehensive support center assigned to us from the US Department of Education that works with each region. We brought these questions to our comprehensive support center, which helped us design a uh, geographic information system basically to portray spatially the pre-K data for our state. On a, on a county by county, town by town basis. So we can share that map with you, it's on our website. It intersects with socioeconomic information, employment information, so we can really, you know, policymakers can then, and, and parents and so forth can look at that data and visualize and, and draw some conclusions about to what extent pre-K uh, is being responsive, uh, or the system's being responsive to the needs in different regions. So that's an example of a sort of, a, I would say a customized solution uh, to questions that emerge uh, that we ask of data all the time. But the bulk of the data collection we do with school districts, it's really the federal government that's asking the questions. You know, And uh, as Susanna alluded to, sometimes there are limitations on how Vermont can respond. Uh, firstly, our governance structure is, is fairly unique. Uh, I would say in Northern New England, we have you know, the shared, let's say the supervisory union model, which is fairly unique. In most parts of the country, there's the district is the essential sort of compliance building block, if you will. Um, but we also, in Vermont, we have low numbers in a lot of those entities. So to Susanna's point about suppression of data, that's always a perennial issue. That's really helpful. And I'm just wondering, again, if you could clarify a suppression of data. So when, when the numbers are very small, 
Is it a confidentiality issue in some ways that we 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 don't ask for certain kinds of data? Does it yeah, it gets basically this term suppression is usually uh, the beginning of a data collection, which asks a question, for example, how many students of color were suspended? Yes. And at some point that's a filter gets applied through, generally through what we call FERPA, mm -hmm. or the Family Education Rights Privacy Act. So the, the, the point of logic there would be to what extent would that data lead someone to be able to do personally identifiable uh, conclusions? So. If, for example, there were only two people of color in a school and there were two suspensions in the year, someone might be able to infer who, who got suspended. And that would be a violation of FERPA. So those, those kinds of issues sometimes emerge in our data. That's very helpful. But to, to the larger question, so my, you know, um, first point, I can talk a lot more about data collection, but I would just make the observation uh, that um, we, we are interested in improving data quality. I think I say we, I think all Vermonters, including members of the General Assembly, particularly data quality in education. Uh, we've done some work in this area in terms of automating our processes and uh, really in a good place, you know, and I think the pre-K map's a great example of using modern visualization tools to be able to answer uh, questions that people have of the data. Um, I'm, I tend to be fairly protective of secretary of creating other data collection processes outside of that sort of automation workflow, uh, because we've worked really hard uh, to pay down, I'll call it technical debt, if you will. We've been using very antiquated tools at the agency over the years. We've made some great strides using modern tools. Um, so anytime we create a new data collection process, I wanna make sure it can exist within that workflow uh, because we have, um, we, we've built a data division in the agency with data scientists and they're great folks. Love to have them come in and testify at some point. But anytime we take them away from doing that modernization work or the required work, it distracts us from our ability to continue and improve our abilities in data reporting. So I would just sort of call that out as one, one observation of this bill that um, I would recommend working with the existing statutory structure, which is to, if, if we think we need more information, if we think we need more reporting on data, uh, I would encourage the General Assembly to direct the secretary and the, therefore the Agency of Education to do that work. Um, certainly, we welcome the opportunity to work with stakeholder groups to design a data collection. If, if um, there's interest in, in those, asking those questions, uh, particularly from disadvantaged com communities or folks that have been disenfranchised in some of these processes, that's exactly what the data collections are for. And we would welcome the opportunity to, to work with folks to design a data collection. Uh, but my point would be that uh, the agency is really the apparatus that we have in state government to uh, implement any data collection. And it's, it's a distraction to have another entity doing that. And I think it ultimately undermines our data quality. Um, the second point I'd make about the bill, which is I should have said in my introduction, uh, we're supportive of the bill. Um, we think it's important work. Um, and I just want to piggyback a bit off Susanna's uh, comments because our I say R is we were contemplating uh, reflecting on our COVID experience and particularly what's going on this year across the country in terms of race, race relations and hate crime and so forth. We arrived at a discipline uh, or the interest of in having a state level committee on discipline, not necessarily from the data conversation, but as a strategy, uh, a series of strategies in a, a sort of portfolio, if you will, around expanding equal opportunity for our students. Um, and what I, I provided today in my written testimony is sort of an outline of four uh, strategies we see uh, being central to that. And one of them is uh, a state level committee to look at uh, discipline and particularly exclusionary discipline practices. And I think, you know, one of the, the things I just emphasized from Susanna's testimony, um, it's, it's a great question to ask, do we have sufficient data? Do we need more data? Um, but one of the things I've, I think for many educational leaders we've taken away this year is that um, that should not delay our action. Uh, we have sufficient data. We know what best practice is in discipline. And we know there's some innovation going on even in Vermont in regard to that. So it's really a question of highlighting or uh, modernizing our approaches to discipline to make sure they're culturally and racially responsive to all students. Once again, our commitment here is about equal opportunity. Um, and I think it would be useful in that regard to have a state level committee to identify those practices and, and to call them out and to put pressure on the system to adopt them. Um, we don't need necessarily more data to do that to justify that work. Um, I think it's, it's well known in the field of education. We have research on that. We have models of best practice. Um, and I, I don't think it's necessarily uh, 
just based on what I know of this area, that it, that it wouldn't take two years of study, a collection study of data to come to that conclusion. And my fear is that we'd waste two years, particularly at this moment in history that we're in. Um, there is a sense of urgency that the system move forward, I think, and in, in adopt more of an action disposition to take on some of these uh, significant uh, institutional issues. Um, so that, that's a point I think I would also um, highlight that certainly sympathetic and interest in advancing a state level committee, I think it's time. Um, I think the mechanics of data collection, uh, just from a sort of a clinical perspective are concerning to me what's being proposed. I could think of some better ways to do that. But then secondly, I would situate the work uh, from our perspective in a broader uh, strategy around uh, expanding equal opportunity or, or ensuring equal opportunity for all of our students. And we've promoted some other strategies in there around curriculum and so forth that we think are also important. Great. Committee, questions? Senator Persley. Yeah, thank you, Secretary French, for that. those last comments. I'm glad to hear that you're, you know, interested in moving forward and not just waiting for the data collection, as, as, as we know that there's no time to lose uh, on making these changes. One, and I liked your four suggestions in your written testimony that I saw. One thing I wondered if you could kind of give us an update, or maybe it's not you or somebody else, but when you, in your number two is to expand the charge of the Act One working group. And I know the working group in Act One ends, I think it's next year, 2022, but I wondered if because of COVID or other things, before we add work to them without ex, you know expanding their, their lifespan that we, we know where they are. Maybe we just hear from them later, but I haven't heard an update on their on their work yet this year. Yeah, I know they will be bringing that forward to you. I, you know, my sense of that, the work has been going very well. Um, I know they've reached out to the state board. They have an obligation to report to the state board as well. So they're in the process of doing that. Um, the point I'd highlight uh, that's brought into our my written testimony, and I think this is gonna be a big policy debate particularly in this historic moment that we're in for Vermont, it's about the, what is the role of curriculum? So we've, um, it was brought out in the Act One uh, debate. Uh, we have a construct in Vermont where the State Board of Education adopts curriculum standards like the Common Core and so forth, but then local school districts um, are charged with coordinating and developing the curriculum for their school districts. And I think what I've noticed, uh, particularly with the Act One uh, conversation, um, there's, there's an interest in going further than just promoting standards, you know, that people actually also want to get into this uh, issue of curriculum appropriately. You know, we see that with the civics education uh, conversation that's emerging now as well. So I think, you know, we're, uh, we have to be cautious about that to a certain extent. Uh, we don't, don't want to see curriculum necessarily overly, you know, let's say influenced by a political conversation. On the other hand, um, there is a need, I think, to perhaps be more forceful, particularly in some of these areas. So I think the compromise that we're promoting is this idea of a model curriculum. So the, the state responsibility would begin to be to promulgate model curriculums that districts could use, at least as a starting point, so that each school district isn't necessarily starting from scratch. Um, and we would, I think when I say we, meaning the agency, uh, would be the conveners of that conversation. So we could bring together stakeholder groups around different curriculum areas and say, here, you know, beyond the sort of the next level down from standards, here's a curriculum framework for a specific area. Um, once again, it's not, it's not unusual for states to provide that role uh, in, in other locations. And I think, I think some of these conversations because of their importance now um, will generate some interest in seeing the state uh, produce model curriculum in some of these areas. So I think that's, that's what we're promoting sort of the beginning of that conversation. Okay, great. And I see, Ms. Gattasis is here, so maybe we'll hear from her. I'm pretty sure she's the chair of that working group. So thank you. Are there any, any other questions? Uh, Senator Hooker, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Secretary French, uh, your number four uh, in your testimony is a task force on school discipline reform. Would this be instead of, is this incorporating what this bill proposes? And would this be the um, AOE's um, answer to what the bill proposes as far as a, a council goes? Yeah, we haven't done the crosswalk. I would just observe their parallel ideas. Um, we, once again, starting internally uh, and working from Susanna's work broadly in state government, 
acknowledging that there, we would benefit from having a task force on this area. So I, I would just observe they're very similar concepts, perhaps, you know, starting from different places. Uh, I see Senate Bill 16 is emerging from a question about data. What data do we have? What data don't we have? But I think there's mutual interest in convening a state level entity of some sort uh, to be a convener of this conversation and to um, advance the conversation towards action. So I, I think there's plenty of opportunity. We haven't done that crosswalk. We're happy to do that, whatever we can do to help the, the bill uh, get through. Um, but I would just observe this is this was sort of our thinking. It wasn't as a reaction to Senate uh, Bill 16. It's just we had been working independently on this. Okay, and can you just comment perhaps on the intersection between AOE and corrections or law enforcement? Yeah, once again, we did not contemplate that in our approach. Uh, uh, we see that, I think someone had mentioned previously, you know, I asked the question, what is the connection? Um, from our perspective, from an equal opportunity perspective, and particularly uh, an interest in moving districts towards an action disposition on this, uh, we didn't make the connection to other agencies. Um, perhaps that could be accomplished through the task force membership, um, but we saw the task force, mem task force members really being uh, more representative of the broader community and stakeholder groups, including uh, educators, uh, but also parents and so forth, not necessarily from other areas of state government. Thank you. Senator Chittenden. Secretary Frentz, I recall you speaking yesterday about the budget, and I heard you say something about standardizing back office software for public schools. Um, I, if I'm here remembering incorrectly, please uh, adjust my thinking. But do you see that as an opportunity to integrate some of the standardization that this bill is calling for when it comes to tracking these things in conformance with what we're reporting to the at the federal level, but also enabling some statewide or state to Vermont specific tracking? Yeah, I appreciate the question. It is, it's important, I think, uh, to acknowledge that uh, there's a couple of variables uh, driving what we call modernization. One is to improve the quality of the data we have. And, you know, basically what we have right now, the, the construct is that locals, the local school districts have what we call a transactional database. On a daily basis, they're recruiting, they're uh, recording attendance, uh, discipline, grades for students, uh, residency, the basic biographical information of staff and students. And then uh, periodically they export data out of this local student information system to the state uh, longitudinal system. So in between those two things, when we start thinking about data quality, uh, basically what we wanna do is reduce the opportunity for any of these data to be modified along the way, multiple hands having to touch them, arrange them, visualize them, whatever it is. So those automatic processes allow us to do that. A point of vulnerability in that chain right now is the variability of the local school district information systems. Uh, we have considerable turnover of school staff in those positions. So, and these are not necessarily simple systems to operate. There's a, you know, as I mentioned, there's a whole federal, federal data dictionary sort of approach and uniformity that has to be learned and the reporting uh, requirements themselves are fairly sophisticated. So it's challenging and we see the pattern across the state as districts have turnover in those positions, it's really hard for us to bring those people up to speed. So we think uh, an important strategy would be to uh, introduce a state level student information system that can be used at the local level. And then the state basically functions um, on a level of extracting data on the backside of that system. It's, there's no more exporting, if you will. We all live in that ecosystem. It's a model that's done in many states. Um, so. This, this, this initiative is just an example, I think, of, of good questions that policymakers and stakeholders should be asking of the education system. And our inability to produce quality data should be a sign that that's an issue per se. But I would just, I would disagree with the proposed solution here, which is to create another entity to create a manual data collection process where we should be putting pressure on this automation process and ensuring that whatever we ask of the system at this sort of moment where we're trying to build that automation for our long-term goals, that it doesn't distract us from that mission. So I, I would encourage us to ask the questions of the data and I'm very interested in, in trying to respond to those questions uh, through a, a design process, but I also don't wanna uh, be distracted from that modernization work because that just sets us back. Every time we have to do a manual data collection of the system, it just it, it diminishes our capacity to make progress and improve what is our overall goal. Other questions? Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for taking the time again today to be with us. Uh, and thank you again for yesterday, which was incredibly comprehensive and helpful. And uh, we'll look forward to continuing our work with you on this as we move forward.
Yeah, thank you. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Amanda, I apologize for calling you by your first name, but I would love to know how to pronounce your last name before I butcher it. I appreciate that, um, Garces. Garces, great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, I understand you're not new to the committee, but the, uh, the membership has changed slightly and uh, looking forward to hearing your thoughts on S16. Um, I see, thank, thank you so much for having me here. Um, so I want to introduce myself. I am the Director of Policy, Education and Outreach for the Vermont Human Rights Commission. Our mission um, as an agency is to promote full civil and human rights in Vermont. We protect people from unlaw unlawful discrimination in housing, state government, and places of public accommodation, which includes schools. Um, we enforce it through anti-discrimination laws, through investigations, conciliations, and litigations. The commission provides education and training and develops um, and advances policy relating to the protection of the most vulnerable, those belonging in protected categories, including women, children, black and other people of color, new Americans, persons with disabilities and members of our LGBTQ community. I am really happy to be here and thank you for the opportunity to testify on this bill. Uh, it's a new year and we really hope that this year brings hope for many of you, uh, we are very lucky in Vermont to have organizations and grassroots groups who are committed to education and who envision an education system rooted in transformative justice and equity. And I am hoping their voices reach you this year. Um, and I am here to offer myself as a support to reach those voices who are um, not always present. Um, I first want to say that I reached out to the disability rights community and asked for their feedback on this bill and their, their thoughts are included here. I respectfully suggest that to have them weigh in uh, to this important bill because this is really impacts their community. In regards to um, S16, uh, I appreciate that the intent of the bill is, uh, but find that there, there might be other mechanisms where we can get to the goal. The Vermont Human Rights Commission is part of many councils, task forces mandated by our legislative body. The creation of yet another working group without sufficient funds to do its work is troublesome. And as someone who has advocated for other unfunded councils and working groups, I am now urging you to not go that route. Um, as the chair of Act One, the Ethnic Studies and Social Equity Working Group, which I hope to comment uh, short chair at work. I know firsthand of the amount of work that it takes to manage the working group and the work that is behind making the information accessible to all participants. That is no small task. And we should make sure that if we want to include impacted and marginalized families in any working group, that we have, that we ensure accessibility because that in itself is an expertise. One thing that stands out is the makeup of the council as an advocate pointed out, weighs heavily on officials within the system or are in policy positions. If we want equity, we need to move away from the current practice so that we can really move our state to where it needs to go. We must support the voices of those who have been marginalized and impacted, and that representation should be majority. It is a very different experience and as the wise Ed Paquin, if you have not met him from the Disability Rights uh, Vermont, it stated it will be more successful if the council had a better balance with those who run today's system and those, those who would like to see it change. If you decide to go this route, here are some recommendations around compositions. Disability organizations should be included and should be appointed by the Vermont Center for Independent Living, Air or Developmental Disabilities Council. Caregivers of students with disabilities and students of, or former students with disabilities uh, should be selected from organizations who work in those communities. We have such a rich amalgam of organizations here in Vermont who have championed disability rights and they should be the ones directing the best people for this work. I'm going to emphasize that they are the ones supporting our families with litigation and other support services. 
an advocate who works with families also thought about the fact that school districts often contract with designated agencies to provide educational and behavioral support to students with disabilities, particularly for students with emotional disabilities and students with significant behavior challenges. This program should also be represented and should be required to, go to receive that data, to collect data. Uh, BIPOC organizations from Black, Indigenous, people of color should also support in the appointment in, in this um, and, who, and who have been affected. It's proportional when it comes to issues, to this issue of discipline. Uh, individuals from the LGBTIQA community are also impacted by this and should be included in this conversation. We already know that data collection is hard issue in our state. Report after report, we keep saying we need more data, but creating a council does not solve our issue. We need to be bolder. Our data collection lacks consistency. We need to standardize it and require the collection. We should have an AOE public dashboard so we can access the data and should be disaggregated by race, ethnicity, disability, and language. In 2017, the Vermont Legal Aid report called Kicked Out, if you have not seen it, I really encourage you, talked about uh, students of color and students of disabilities being two to three times more likely to be suspended and excluded than their white counterparts. We would like to see that report that progress report, what's happening since 2015, right? And so how, how can we make those systems better? Uh, did we get better? Is there progress or are we not moving? We will also like to see the collection of data for uh, on referrals to law enforcement and a response to discipline. How many students are removed by law enforcement and called by administrators? And how many stu students receive citations to juvenile court or behavior at school? And then let's end to say we're doing, what are we doing with this report? Or maybe let's start there. What are we doing with this report? Uh, let's first decide that so that we can be bolder and move this work. Uh, we know the data already points to this proportional impact to students with disabilities and students of color, black students, students um, from the LGBTQ community. So let's not study anymore, let's do. Um, so that's all I'm asking is we can study, yes, but we also need to do. So a, a council needs to do and study at the same time. There's no or, there shouldn't be an or, there should only be an end. Um, and so I just reiterated what, what um, Susana said and I appreciate um, our AOE. Oh, my fr Secretary French and uh, for you know having that same sentiment. I am open for questions. Uh, Ms. Garces, that was, was very helpful. Uh, just a couple of clarifying uh, questions. Um, in general, it sounds like, and please correct me if I'm, I'm, I'm wrong here, uh, you support moving in this direction with, with the changes that you outlined and those being a, a real rework of the membership of the community um, as well as sort of what we heard from, I think, both Susanna and uh, Ms. Davis and Secretary French, which is the, you know, there are things that can be done now and let's not postpone for two years because we do have some data that we can actually start to make good, healthy changes uh, in our system based on, based on that data. Yes, I, I, I think that what I'm saying is that if you choose to, go this route yeah these are the recommendations that i'm making i believe in echo susana there's already some task force mm -hmm. um there was mention about act, the act one working group i cannot say that we want that work because i need to speak to the um to the rest of the committee but um that that is part of the, there are already task forces that are looking at data racial um yeah, the ratio, all the data. So like, who is the best group to be doing this? Do we need to reinvent the field? Do we need to do that? Um, can we, yeah, what are the systems that are already in place that we can move forward? Because there are many reports that have been submitted, which Susana mentioned some, 
that already specifies some of the data that we need to look and strengthen. And that there is two basic principles right now. We can collect all the data, but we, if we don't have uniformity and if we don't have consistency, then it's going to be flawed data again. And then we're gonna keep going on this route. So how can we make our systems better and so that we can move the work forward? And is this the right team of people joining the, um, so it, it, that, yeah, is, is this the right group? So if you choose to go, these are my recommendations. Like, yeah. Let's bring all the people that are impacted so that they have a voice, um, the people that are doing the work so that they have a voice and let's balance. This is one of the most important things of act one is that there is balance between the people that are in power or in the systems and the people that are out of the system. And there is a mix. Great. Uh, questions, yes, Senator Perslick. Yeah. Thank you, uh, gosh, this, that's, it's great, great to see it in the committee again, and looking forward to maybe in future time, just hearing a, an update on, on Act One and the work that you've been doing there. But have you seen uh, Secretary French's testimony and his four recommendations? Have you seen those yet? No, I did not, but I did hear his testimony. Okay, because there's one in there about expanding the, the Act One working group. So we can hear from you later, maybe when you're in, just with that hat on, uh, what you think about that. And, and sort of similar to that, I wondered what you thought of the, your, your, not your working group, but the, the, that working group taking on some of these things. And because how you opened up is like, we don't really need an, yet another group, which often, like you said, we want to include these people that have been marginalized, but then it's hard for them to participate because of uh, those issues. And we're kind of like basically asking them to do all the work for the state that we don't want to put forward. And it's a lot of work that we're asking and it's very important work. So I wondered if, if you either now or later would have suggestions on how we could either use your working group or uh, Secretary French's other suggestion of a different group, instead of just kind of imposing on more people to have, have meetings, we give them the per diem, but that's not really sufficient for the for the work. So, yes, and, the, and there there are some lessons that we're learning from Act One. And so, one thing that I would say is that if there's funding to make the work possible, then it is a no brainer. Give put the funding. So like right now. We should all be thankful for the HRC for allowing me to do the amount of hours that I'm putting on Act One. Um, my co-chair who uh, was appointed that by the Vermont um, College for Ethics and Social Equity School is doing tremendous work. I apologize that you guys have not seen the report. There must have been a mix between the change of committees, uh, but we just submitted a report, Act One just submitted a report um, last month and we are asking for appropriations because of the amount of work because the accessibility piece is really hard. We are looking at statues, we're looking at data, we're looking at things that you know, not everybody understands. So how do we have a meaning, meaningful you know, response? They're subjects of their own reality. They are sharing their expertise of life experience and we give them a statue that I can't even read. So we have to translate that, right? To say, this is what we're doing. So the same thing for this committee, I would recommend like if we're bringing in people, let's make it accessible. That means we need to hire someone with that expertise. There are people that do that for a living. They translate materials, um, they work with our disability community. And, and so like we are trying to develop all these documents that we're putting in like different, not even languages, but different, um, like making it third grade level, which is not a small task. So like, it's like all, all this work that comes when we decide as a state, which I really appreciate, that we are going to include impacted members of our community in these really big policy decisions because, because they have been marginalized for so long. We're gonna give them the voice and the work, but then there's no funding for the work. So that makes it hard. So uh, I am very fortunate to have a working group, like the working group that we have, uh, and Susanna, it's in that working group that's doing amazing work. And so like, I, I wanna see that as a model. I was like, okay, 
here's this group that is really doing good work that is collective that is um and how can we translate to this other group that has an imbalance of power already uh imbalance of voices um and that it's it's not like doing that extra step so like let, let, let's make it right that's what i'm saying the long the long answer great Thank you. Thanks for joining us. And Thank we look you. forward to having you back in uh, soon uh, to go over the Act One report. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Fannin. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, Jeff Fannin, for the record, uh, from Vermont NEA. And thank you for giving me a few minutes here today to talk with you about uh, S16, the, what I, I refer to as a School Discipline Advisory Council. Bill, um, and it was great to hear Susanna, Secretary French, uh, and uh, Amanda's testimony. All three were very good, and, and uh, I'll try to alter mine to to or to improve upon mine uh, in the wake of theirs. They were all uh, very impressive. Um, before I begin, though, I just want to acknowledge again the uh, that we're still in a health pandemic. Teachers, educators are still. Uh, working remotely in some cases, hybrid. A lot of them are in person. Most of them are still uh, working, showing up to school in person. I see Senator Terenzini with the young child there. Um, you know, it's, it's a diverse, rich year. I'll say it that, that way. Uh, and the public school employees are, are doing their best in a challenging environment in a health pandemic. Um, you know, they've stepped up in magnificent ways along with their school leaders to make sure the kids are educated to make sure that they are fed uh, and, and their social emotional needs are met. So uh, a lot is going on in schools right now. It, it, it looks different than it did a year ago at this time, um, but hopefully we'll be back to normal. I don't know when. And uh, it's important to just keep that as a, as a backdrop for me, at least personally, that, that uh, a lot of educators are going through a lot right now. It is not easy. Uh, and they've just created great workspaces for their students so that they're safe and they're educationally appropriate, wherever that space may be, on, online, in person, or a combination thereof. So um, uh, these essential frontline workers are doing their best in a really challenging environment. Um, so I'll stop there, but just that's always a backdrop for me. So thank you. Thank you. Um, as for S16, uh, uh, in general, we support the creation of the, of the advisory council, uh, but we do have some suggestions and, and uh, uh, Ms. Davis rep, uh, you know, beat me to the punch. We didn't share testimony, but um, some of her, her words uh, are better spoken than mine, but um, right out of the box, she mentioned uh, the, the, what I, I guess I call the overemphasis on corrections and law enforcement. And, and I call that the framing uh, of the bill itself. And I don't think that's the intent of the, uh, of the uh, sponsors at all. In, in fact, I'm sure that it's not, but it just does, a, it does come across as being overly emphasis of corrections, law enforcement. And um, I think we can do better. I'll say that. It's an opportunity for uh, a revision of the bill itself uh, as we move forward, if in fact you decide to move forward. Um, so, and again, the corrections and criminal justice angle appears again in the makeup of the council itself. Uh, I, I think uh, Amanda Garces did a nice job of, of outlining some other groups that might be uh, worthy of, an, uh, um, uh, being participants on the group. I'd also add to that, um, you know, that many marginalized students that we're talking about here in this bill uh, are suffering from trauma. You know, not, their own, not of their own doing, not their fault, in any way, and we ought to acknowledge that reality and uh, perhaps put some people on there from uh, the so social worker community. Um, I, I think Secretary French mentioned uh, DCF possibly, mental health, uh, uh, Ms. Davis mentioned. So there are other groups out there that probably should be added to this to recognize, <clears throat> excuse me, that the students we're talking about here come as they are and we need to make sure that we um, genuinely look at who they are and how they arrive in the system. Um, and again, the system is largely the education system that we're talking about here. And I, so the emphasis on the criminal justice uh, is not to say that we shouldn't use those folks as resources. I just don't know that they should be primary uh, council participants. Um, so um, 
And finally, you know, with regard to the uh, the data and the agency of education, I will say this: that um, under uh, subsection, uh, I think it's subsection F, and and the agency is designed to or at task with providing technical, administrative, and legal assistance to the council. Um, but I don't see any associated resource attached to it. Uh, I, I quite frankly think the agency of education is overburdened as it is now. And, uh, and Secretary French may, may not agree necessarily, but I, I, from my vantage point, they need resources to do the many things that we've asked them to do. Um, so yesterday, Secretary French mentioned uh, data, you know, the, the back systems, that's been going on for a couple of years. Um, and, and it needs to, if, if they genuinely want to roll it out, I think we've got to give them the resources to do it. This would be one aspect of it. But if we're going to give you know, lawyers to give legal advice to this council as they advance, you know, maybe there, we ought to have a designated position to support the work of this. This is a high priority for the state. And when something is of a high priority to any organization or any entity, you see it in their budget. Um, their priorities are, are seen in their budget decisions. And I don't see that here, and I think we need to have it here, uh, quite frankly. So, um, um, and the other piece I would look at too is, and I think Secretary French mentions it. Uh, I guess maybe you could extrapolate that he mentions it, but certainly school board policies, and maybe Sue Suglas will speak to that. There, those ought to be reviewed. Uh, you know, I heard from a teacher talking about zero tolerance policies, and they may be appropriate in some instances, but maybe we ought to look at those to see how they overly affect. Uh, uh, students of color, uh, students with disabilities, or any other marginalized uh, group of students. Um, so school policies also weigh into this, and I don't see any mention of them anywhere, but I think that, uh, um, you know, it's certainly worthy of uh, a good idea to look at. So with that, we, um, we do think there, there's a need for data. Um, it does help and guide our decisions, and it's been, uh, there's a lot of it out there. But there is a lot, as Secretary French said, that we can't see because of the small numbers. And so we need to figure out a way around that, if you will, <clears throat> to genuinely address the underlying concerns. Um, so with that, I will uh, stop uh, and take any questions you may have. And uh, happy to be here today as well as later in the future, if you think necessary. Questions? So I'll just say, you know, well, you know, I mean, that was, that was, it, it was very helpful. I mean, it, it seems, I mean, there are definitely some common themes coming up you know, that, you know, you mentioned or, or reiterated around, you know, corrections and law enforcement, um, the trauma and mental health uh, representative on, on the committee, um, certainly AOE and the need for resources. Um, all very, very, very important. Senator Lyons, please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it's not so much, it's not a question really, uh, but it is uh, an affirmation of some of the things that, I, that we've been listening to. Um, uh, and I, I think it's important. I don't know what the Act One Council is, and I apologize for that, but I, I really don't. Uh, I've been on education and I look forward to hearing about it. I do know that we have established a prevention chief in the Office of Administration who, when that person is hired, will be working, um, I would think, alongside uh, Susanna Davis. We've also put in place uh, a, a cross uh, agency and department uh, prevention council within the Department of Health that will be looking at um, trauma-informed policies to help mitigate the effects of, uh, around social determinants of health and include those issues that we've been talking about today uh, as diversity, um, issues around diversity and so on. And, and including in that mental health. So I'm, you know, so I, and then I hear the need for folks coming in from VCDR, the Vermont Council on Disability Rights, and we need to have DAs and SSAs involved and then I hear that we have insufficient resources within the AOE to accomplish its goals. And at the same time, these other organizations that have been identified are also stretched thin. So we know that our schools <clears throat> really need to have 
they need the reinforcements that will help build this culture of prevention and be a trauma informed um, group of professionals, which, you know, I understand working very hard on that in, in schools. So for me, it, it, it seems like the biggest thing we need to do is to have boots on the ground. We really do need to be implementing some of the things that we know about and coordinating between and among all of the different councils and leaders uh, in state government and elsewhere. So the, that's just a comment. Uh, uh, the more I hear, the more I think uh, coordination uh, could be um, really important in this process. <laughs> It's a it's a great comment, uh, Senator Lyons, and I, it reminded of um, it's really it's taking us a little bit of field. But in after nine eleven, what the law enforcement community realized was they they had no way of talking with one another. They had they they missed a lot of communications, if you will, and, and a lot of signs that weren't uh, swapped back and forth or whatever. And and maybe that's what you made some a poor analogy given what I said earlier. But but the truth is what I think you're talking about is coordinating all of these efforts, uh, these multiple efforts at, this, at some level, uh, whether I think it's gotta be the state, I'm, I'm thinking aloud here, but to ensure that all of these things that we are doing, and we are doing a lot, uh, are well-coordinated, well-resourced, appropriately resourced. Uh, some of us um, that will testify after I am, I, I am here, um, this morning we're up in Ways and Means talking about resources, I was at least, uh, in, in getting that for schools in the Ed Fund. And so the Ed Fund is, is, is particularly well positioned right now financially, but we wanna make sure that it's there. I know it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, it, we wanna make sure that it's there, not just this year, but next year as well, as, as kids come back and their needs are, are significant. And we need to make sure that there's some coordination of, that, of, of this issue that we're talking about here in, a, in S16, that it happens. That, and and I, that was a theme from several people that we can't just collect data for the sake of collecting it. We actually have to do something with it. I thank you. I agree with you. And um, obviously the prevention council is something that's near and dear to the work that we've done in health and welfare and the prevention chief who is, should be sitting in the uh, secretary of administration's office uh, is I think that that's the level that we need to have this coordination, period. You know, and then the resources to accomplish the goals and the recommendations, but um, that's my own opinion. Thank you. Other questions? Oh yes, Senator Hooker. I guess after listening to Senator Lyons, my question is, how do we um, tease out what we have already for data, what recommendations have been made, and listening to uh, Secretary French and uh, Ms. Davis and Ms. Garces, the fact that you know we do have the data and now is the time to begin things, even though we need to collect more data. So what would be a, a good step toward collecting the reports that have already been made, the data that's already been collected, and to um, glean from that, you know, where we can start with some of the recommendations? Who would do something like that? Would that be up to education? Would it be up to, you know, um, ledge council who who would, would have access to these reports so that they could go through and get information out of them that would be usable right now so that we don't have to wait two years for a council to come up with mm -hmm. other recommendations. Yeah, it's a great question. I'm not sure I know the exact answer. I, my, my thought would be that schools are pretty strapped right now with, you know, trying to operate. I'll just say that. And, and, and that's, you know, from the administrators all the way down to everybody else in, in working every day in the school uh, with students, you know, in their classroom or, or on their bus or in their cafeteria. So um, I think it's got to be, you know, my thought is that the agency of education, if we're going to focus on education uh, and not the criminal justice aspect of this, which I acknowledge is later on down the road, but if we really want to get at this at the earliest stages, 
then it's got to be, I think, the agency of education. But again, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat myself that I think they need the resources to do that. That is not an insignificant lift to pull all the various reports together, coordinate those, uh, as Senator Lyons you know, mentioned, from the Department of Health. Um, you know, there are other groups that are doing some of this work, and I think it would be, it needs a, a concerted, focused effort, perhaps at the Agency of Education to, to make that happen. Yeah, I mean, I, just to, to add to that, it seems like so much in our country has been studied, has been examined. Sometimes it really is taking the research, curating it, putting it out there and getting some decisions uh, made or get some policy advanced based on what it has already been done. That being said, I think simultaneously continuing to collect data of some, you know, uh, relevant data makes sense. Absolutely. Okay. Anything else? Uh, Mr. Fannin, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Thank you all. And we know you're doing some other work for us and we look forward to uh, getting you back in sometime soon. Absolutely. Look forward to it. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, committee, why don't we take a break until five minutes after three? Uh, we've been at it for a while. Uh, and uh, come back then and, and hear from our last witnesses. Thank you. Mr. Nichols, good to see you. <clears throat> nice to see you too, sir. We appreciate you coming in, having a conversation around uh, S-16 and look forward to uh, hearing your thoughts, uh, questions, concerns, uh, support of. Uh, we'll just leave it there. All right, wonderful, thank you, uh, appreciate it. Uh, would you like me to share the screen? You, I've re we sent testimony to you. I can actually show it on the screen or if you'd rather have me just speak to it and it's up to you. I believe there might be a Senator or two that does not have it, not able to access it. So why don't you go ahead for now and put it on the screen? Okay, Jeannie, have you given me co-hosting rights? I'll let Jeannie uh, do that. I have. Awesome. Should have known you would have had that already done for me. All right. Everybody see that okay? All right. So this testimony is on behalf of uh, the organizations at Two Prospect Street, the Vermont School Boards Association, the Principals Association, and the Superintendents Association. And uh, Sue, who's the Executive Director of Vermont School Boards Association, and Jeff, who's the Executive Director of the Superintendents Association, are also here to respond to any questions at the end. And I want to make special note that Chelsea Myers, the Associate Executive Director of the Vermont Superintendents Association is with us. And Chelsea did a lot of the legwork on this and bringing the thoughts of Sue and I and Jeff into one document that, that provided this testimony. So I want to reach out and thank her for that. So thanks, first of all, for inviting us to speak to your committee on S-16. We want to convey that our association's commitment to advancing equity in schools across Vermont is number one responsibility. We recognize and support the need to examine exclusionary discipline practices as a whole, and in particular, how these practices disproportionately affect traditionally underserved students. So in that spirit, here are some considerations we ask you to, to uh, think about. In terms of data collection and transparency, we believe that data transparency is an important tool for district and state leaders to examine their practices and adjust accordingly. School districts are required already to report exclusionary dis dis excuse me, discipline data, including desegregated reporting to the Office of Civil Rights. We ask that consideration is given to reducing redundancy in reporting, and to the extent possible, have the Agency of Education utilize data that is already being reported. We recommend considering strategies to improve the fidelity of the reporting of this existing data and more transparent reporting at the state level. And we, are, we recognize there are some small end numbers in some schools where you know, that has to be taken into consideration. A complete picture of the data that exists at the local and state levels is a critical first step in identifying what information might be needed. And any additional data reporting and transparency should meet all requirements for student privacy. That said, we also do want to state that we don't believe we should be waiting for two years to take any, any action. We believe that there are many steps that can be taken right now. We'll talk about some of those in this testimony, 
And we really don't want to be in a situation where we have paralysis by analysis. Uh, let's take steps that we know that we already need to take and then continue to collect data and adjust as we go. So I want to draw your attention uh, for, to a report out of Delaware called the Status of School Discipline and State Policy. We have the link here in the testimony for you, and I'm going to read verbatim from that. Requires the State Department of Education to compile and release an annual school discipline report that includes statewide and individual school totals for out-of-school suspensions, expulsions, alternative school assignments, and in-school suspensions, all desegregated by race, ethnicity, gender, disability status, grade level, limited English proficiency, incident type, and discipline duration. Schools meeting certain thresholds of suspension or expulsion for three consecutive years must then review their discipline policies, assure proper implementation of restorative justice practices, and submit a correction plan to the State Department of Education. This approach points to the importance of coupling data collection and transparency with also appropriate and supported accountability measures. And it has an emphasis on growth and improvement rather than a punitive response. Uh, goes along a lot with what Senator Sears was talking about earlier today uh, with you about improvement and accountability. Any additional emphasis on data collection, reporting and transparency should consider proper support to local school districts on appropriate use of the data and best practices for considering data to improve policies and practice. Rhode Island Department of Education provides an example of how data collected can be supported by resources on best practices. We also put a link in this document that you can look at for that, for that connection. We also want to mention that one of the most important things is proactive support of the field. Teachers and uh, educators of all stripes are, are tired. They're working through a pandemic. They're, they're feeling a little beat upon in terms of retirement and uh, issues around the vaccine and morale is not real great right now. And most teachers did not come into education as mental health trained personnel. So supports are gonna be really important for them if we're gonna ask them to take on more responsibility in that area. So encouraging and supporting the use of alternative strategies to support students at risk for exclusionary practices is imperative. Our schools have a number of established and emerging structures that can reduce the occurrence of exclusionary practices. As a state, we think we should leverage some of the following. A continued emphasis on the importance of high quality multi-tiered systems of support, MTSS, social and emotional learning, trauma-informed practices, positive behavior interventions and support, and restorative justice. Equity and culturally responsive practices are fundamental in the design and implementation of each of these frameworks. Like any other framework, the impl implementation is key, knowing the context of the children that you work with and making sure that they're culturally inclusive. There needs to be a focus on integrated mental health services. This has been a huge problem for a long time uh, and it's something that we need to try to find a way to address. It needs to provide best practices around building a positive school climate and to reinvigorate the need for a well-vetted statewide school climate survey, which we all fully support. There needs to be an increase in the availability of and funding for implicit bias training to meet school communities where they are at and is intended to how implicit bias impacts school disciplinary practices. You don't know what you're doing wrong until you're taught what you're doing wrong. We believe that building systems that support alternative methods of schooling need to be in place. There are times when a student may need something more than what can be provided in the regular structure of the school. Schools need support in providing alternative learning environments to support students for whom the general school systems are not effective. This may include strong embedded mental health services for the student within the school. Additionally, uh, in relationship to the S-16, if you were to have a council or a task force, we're recommending that representation from the Vermont school boards be included. School discipline is an area that is currently and appropriately addressed in school board policies at the macro level. We also want to make clear to the committee that supervisory union school district boards are responsible for establishing a supervisory union-wide curriculum. And that's in, in uh, section 261A1 of Title 16. Some topics, uh, some policies related to the topic that we already have in place. All school boards currently have a firearms policy and that is based on VSBA's model policy. This policy is required by law and references federal law. And it includes expulsion as a sanction. 
So an example would be if a student, for example, if I'm a superintendent again, a student brings a gun to school for whatever reason, even if it's a second grader, I would be compelled to have an expulsion hearing. It does not mean the school board needs to expel that student. They certainly could do something different, but there would be an expulsion hearing by, hearing by policy. And then many school boards, uh, if not all, also have a student discipline policy that's based on VSBA's model policy on student discipline. Other things that we think you should consider reducing or eliminating expulsion in grades pre-K through three, this would minimize to the greatest extent possible exceptions to this rule. We realize with any, any law or rule, there could be an like exception, but we wanna close loopholes as best we can. We also think you need to consider private childcare providers and any actions resulting from this work. Nationwide the evidence uh, clearly suggests that pre-K students that are in private uh, centers are expelled at much higher rates than in the K-12 system. And for an example, you can see uh, preschool expulsion and suspension defining the issues paper that we linked here. And prohibiting expulsion and out of school suspensions for most nonviolent infractions, including truancy and attendance issues is another step we could take. Many years ago, before I was a superintendent, I was a principal and we were at a meeting and a principal from a high school that shall not be named, um, they had put in a policy about smoking cigarettes and the policy was that if a kid came to school and was caught with cigarettes, it was automatically a two week out of school suspension, 10 school days. And so, uh, and there was no punishment other than that because if it was their first offense. And what they had, I believe it was like 107 kids at the high school that brought cigarettes to school on the first day of deer hunting. And they were all suspended for two weeks and they all went deer hunting and then they came back to school. So policies don't always do what they're intended to do. So we need to make sure we look at that. So finally, our associations believe that creating more equitable and anti-racist schools is of the utmost importance. Given the complexity and scope of the work, consideration should be given to establishing a designated team or person at the Agency of Education that is able to provide technical assistance, research and report best practices, and lead the complement of statewide initiatives that have, that have been and will continue to be introduced whether you have this task force or not. And we did not talk to Senator Chittenden uh, earlier or um, change our testimony based on what he said, but having some, some leverage of expertise at the, at the state, at the AOE that's leading this, we feel is very important. And with that, we'd be glad to take any questions you may have. Okay, Senator Chittenden, I mean, sorry, Senator Perchlick. Yeah, thanks, Jay. The, your recommendations there at the end about ending expulsions, do you think that's the best place for that is in statute or do you see that happening at, at a different level of the education regulatory system? I think it needs to be in statute. I don't think it's gonna, it's gonna happen unless you have it in statute, uh, Senator Persley. There are some places that have already done that and there, there are exceptions to it. Um, and I'm, I'm not able to think of a case off the top of my head right now. Um, but but pre-K through three, if we're sending those kids home and we're ex expelling those kids, you know, that, that's a real problem. And if we do that, we really are buying into the present uh, to uh, school to present pipeline. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, to think about kids going home, I, you know, I, I don't know how kids get caught up. Uh, it's at any age, um, you know, if you're out, for a week and algebra is being taught or something we've been talking a lot about in this committee, literacy, you know, reading and writing, it, it would, the challenge. And then of course there's the, I, the emotional toll uh, on, you know, being suspended, being expelled. Um, so, other questions? Any comments from uh, others that uh, are being represented by uh, Mr. Nichols? I apologize. I thought uh, you were all going to testify. So, uh, but uh, I figured your committee was working pretty hard, and you could use a little bit of a break. So we decided to pool together, and we do that from time to time if we're all in agreement. Tricking the committee chair. Uh, at Senator Perslick. So can, I, I, can, I don't have your, your testimony up in front of me. So can you just remind me 
I, I know you, you recommended changes to the working group or whatever it's called, the task force or whatever. But did, did you say whether you thought one was needed or if that this could be done some else, other way or like, Secretary French suggested just having a, a task force just talking about talking about that the policies around discipline. Did you touch on that? I, I think the three of us talked about it. Um, I don't necessarily think that it's needed as long as there's a mechanism in place, a mechanism in place to make it happen. But I'd like to see. I like to have Jeff and Sue answer for themselves on that. Hi, uh, this is Jeff Francis. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. I'm the executive director of the Superintendents Association. My view on that is that it would be good if expertise was at the Agency of Education. I think in order to get a broad spectrum of interests, an advisory group of some type uh, is appropriate because there's such widespread community interest in this matter. But when you take a look at some of the functions of the of the of the task force per se, they could be handled by well-qualified employees with something akin to a advisory group or, or an oversight group so that you had a broad spectrum of interest regularly checking in on this matter, both in terms of practices in schools and the data. But the notion that you would form a larger group to do what I would refer to as sort of the expert work or administration might not be required. Um, and I also thought that the, that the testimony with respect to um, weighting toward the mental health side rather than the correction side, that, that resonated with me. This is Sue Siglowski. I'm the executive director of the School Boards Association. And um, I would be in agreement with uh, the comments that Jeff Francis just made. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Yes, please, Senator Hooker. Uh, so once again, it seems that people are in agreement that things are already known there's the data that things should begin. So I guess, um, Mr. Nichols, or one of uh, if any of the witnesses, where would you recommend that we begin? I'll start, and if anybody else wants to jump in, I think you should start by looking at <clears throat> pre-K through three potential legislation that would no longer allow expulsion you know, in that area. And I also think you should look at legislation that would no longer allow expulsion for nonviolent type of behaviors. Uh, I think it's silly to, to expel kids because they brought cigarettes to school. And I did it many times as a superintendent because policy required me to. Uh, but I would much rather see those kids be compelled to be in some type of a pro smoking cessation program or something along those lines and still be able to continue in school. Those are two actionable things that you could, you could jump on right now. So Mr. Nichols, right now in the state, if students student brings a pack of cigarettes to school, are there, are there policies on the books somewhere that would require an, a suspension or expulsion? Yes, not an expulsion, but there are school districts that have a suspension. Um, oftentimes what they'll do is have like a five day suspension, but you can reduce that by two or three days by going in front of a, a committee and I can't think of the name of it right now, but there's a, a committee that meets that you can appeal to them and tell them how you're gonna mitigate. And it's usually made up of the principal, the guidance counselor and a, and a couple people. So there are, there are some districts that have that. There are other districts that have policies that are much more, I guess, progressive in nature would be the way to, the way to say it. And that would not necessarily automatically call for a suspension. But again, they're developed by the local boards. It's not in reflection of any statute. The only real statute thing on expulsions, one, you can't expel a kid more than 10 days unless you have a school board hearing. And then if the kid's a special ed kid, there's a thing, a manifestation determination related to their disability that you have to go through. Uh, I'm not going to spend time on that. And in terms of expulsion, typically um, by Vermont law, you can, a kid can only be expelled for the remainder of the school year or 90 days, whatever is greater. 
unless it's a gun-free schools violation, a weapons violation, and then it could be one calendar year. So in terms of the amount of expulsion, we already are, I think we're in a better place than most states. Many states still, expulsion could mean you're gone from that school, you know, forever. I hope that helps clarify a little bit. So what usually happens in those situations when a student is expelled? In other words, Senator Sears was in here talking earlier, you know, he started a program, God, 40 years ago, 45 years ago, that, you know, really was for those students. But what happens now in those cases? It depends. Sometimes um, students, and I'm thinking more about older students. Yeah. Sometimes they'll go to an uh, enter an adult ed program, okay. you know, if they're actually expelled. Um, I, I can think of one case where a student left school and came back the following year. He actually went, it was a, he brought a weapon to school and threatened another person with it. He was out for a full year. Uh, and he really, he, we really felt he was a risk. Um, and there's been other cases where typically school boards, um, you'll run a hearing and the parents will be there and the student will be there. If the student's over 18, he or she can decide if the parents are there. If the student's under 18, then the parents have to be there and they'll have their counsel with them. And the superintendent uh, would basically work as sort of like the, the judge running the process and the school board would serve as a jury. And the principal would make a recommendation on what they thought should happen. The parents would make a recommendation on what they thought should happen. And ultimately the school board would get to decide up to and including the possibility of expulsion for the rest of the school year or 90 days or in a gun-free schools violation a calendar year. The boards usually want kids back in school. It's just if it's a situation where it's such a safety issue to everybody else, that's, that's typically where that would come in. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, you know, I, I'm in this moment and, and we'll have a committee discussion, you know, a little bit afterward, but it's uh, like everybody's saying, you know, we, we do have a lot of data. We have a lot of information here. Uh, there are steps that we possibly could take legislatively or the agency could direct us. Um, it, does, it doesn't seem productive to wait before making some of these, you know, these changes. Uh, so I appreciate that. Anything else? I think we have, okay, thank you. I think we have uh, one more witness, uh, Ms. McGuire. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Nichols, Mr. Francis, Ms. Zaglowski. Appreciate all of you uh, being with us and uh, certainly more than welcome to stick around. And Mr. Francis, we'll see you tomorrow uh, at 11 a.m., correct? Or at least I will for the superintendent's Look, meeting. Yes, looking forward to it, thank you. Thank you. Ms. McGuire, welcome to Senate Education. Thank uh, you. Good to have you with us. If you would please introduce yourself, uh, tell us a little bit about the organization you're representing and uh, weigh in on S16, we would appreciate it. Great, thank you so much for having me. My name is Erin McGuire. I am the Director of Equity and Inclusion for the Essex Westford School District, but today I am here representing the Vermont Council of Administrators of Special Education. And um, we also reside at Two Prospect with some of the other organizations that you just heard from collectively. Um, and the organization represents a group of people who really are advocating for students with disabilities in schools every day. Um, so it is really one of the only organizations organizations at Two Prospect that really focuses in on a group that is marginalized within the concepts that we're talking about here holistically. And so we thought that it was important to come forward and have a conversation with you about S16. I think the first thing I'd like to share is gratitude for focusing in on this issue. BCSEA definitely has a strong emphasis on equity related to our uh, hopeful forward movement for the state for students with disabilities, but also would like to take a moment to recognize the importance of what we describe as intersectionality in the area of equity. And for our work this particular year and going forward, we really are focusing in on the intersectionality of race and disability. And I appreciate um, some of the comments that have been made around ensuring that we really do bring the conversation forward about students with disability in the context of discipline. 
Um, I, I'd like to make a couple of statements about BCSEA as it relates to disciplinary practices in our conversations as of late, which is that um, we are really at a point where we're questioning why we would ever remove the opportunity for education for any student based on behavior. We know that behavior is communication and sometimes behaviors can be highly problematic, very complicated and very challenging to address. Um, and there are circumstances of safety. I think that um, Jay did a good job at describing some of those kinds of events where we need to think very carefully about how we engage and what we do for students to help them forward given how significant their behaviors become. Um, and we're also really beginning to question why we have um, zero tolerance policies to begin with and what it is we think that we're doing when we have zero tolerance policies related to students. That's really for all students, but particularly for students with disabilities who already have had an experience where um, I would say the education system has yet to really find its way into being able to meet all of their needs sometimes. And so already the general education system is really struggling to meet their needs. We've added special education if those things all fail a student and it's not working well for them and they end up in a disciplinary situation um, and then education is removed, it really, you know, really starts to beg the question. And I think um, Senator Campion, you spoke with that, about that briefly just a few minutes ago. So I just wanted to um, share that BCSEA as an organization is really beginning to contemplate that because of the inequities that we create with how we treat behavior. For students who are coming to us with behaviors that aren't hitting those thresholds, um, you know, they get access to education. And then the students who are having the most challenging behaviors, um, you know, I, I might argue that those are the students who need us most, maybe. And so questioning sort of what is this systemic behavior that we have about removal of education as a right from students for periods of time. It doesn't mean that we don't need to behave differently as educators with those students to keep others safe in those moments. So I would just offer that in addition to what some of the other uh, people have testified to here today. BZSEA also um, does support the intent and wonders about action. So in our, um, our uh, uh, legislative priorities, as we talk about equity, we are in line with the agency of education in the importance of um, curricular representation for all students seeing themselves within their materials and the lenses through which we instruct both current as well as historical events. Um, one of the things that hasn't been talked about here today that we really really feel is related to this topic um, is the diversification of the educator workforce and really feeling like we need to have a conversation about the diversity of our workforce and need to move forward with that um, as we think about how we have these conversations about disciplinary action in schools and then also would extend that concept into the design of any statewide committee that was created to make sure that there is voice for um, a variety of people, especially especially those people who have historically been denied power and voice um, in the past and be careful about who we center in that work. Um, and then we also um, really support a conversation about policymakers thinking carefully about how we ensure equity centered policy development in our state. And that includes related to discipline practices among a myriad of other practices in our schools to make sure that we're carefully considering what we need to be doing. Um, I'm thoughtful about our goal in this conversation about changing practices in schools and how you use committee structures at the state level or task forces at the state level to actually change practices Practice. And I would encourage us to think about that and make sure that as we have a conversation about any task force on discipline, that we're clear about outcomes that will actually change practice. Um, I think that goes to the point of what data do we have and what do we already know and do we really need to prove things more to ourselves? And maybe we do. And I do think high quality data collection is critical in our state. We need to be able to know where we are. In school districts, disaggregating data and understanding intersectionality within your data 
through an equity lens is a critical next step to change educational practices at the local level. And so what we might be able to do related to the expectation of school districts reviewing their own data and running root cause analysis and understanding what their data says and how that should relate to practice change shows up for me as I think about the work that we're talking about here versus a statewide conversation about what our statewide data says and then what. So um, again, sort of linking it back into the then what. Um, I would also like to just make some brief comments about the constitution of a committee. Um, I do think it's important that you have a role for a director of special education in the current bill, it's special educators. And there's a difference in, in that, um, to Jay's point about the complexity of manifestation determinations and the responsibilities that directors of special education hold in determining disciplinary outcomes and working through what is and is not a manifestation of a disability in a disciplinary context, that definitely is administrative work and I think needs to hold a special role within the context of this conversation if you do move forward with a bill that really dives deep into data and understands what that data says. I also wonder about a director of curriculum um, because of the intersection of um, curricular work that I keep hearing about in this context and also the potential for something broader than just discipline. In my written testimony, what you'll notice is that um, there is this question about discipline and then also what else? Because discipline is one aspect of data that we need to look at. I uh, know that the work that Susanna has done across the state, Ms. Davis has done across the state thinking about these issues has not just focused on one data point. And when we just focus on one data point, we might get stuck in that data point. And there are a myriad of data points that we need to be considering related to equity issues across schools. Um, there are a number of people, including myself, who have now come forward and started to do equity leadership in schools. And so school districts have equity leaders in them and equity coaches. And I just have to wonder whether or not that is also an important role to hold. And I would add um, to make sure that uh, students and other stakeholders are part of this group uh, related to my comments earlier about voices that often are not at the table. Intersection and connection with other work happening on equity feels important. And I don't have an answer for you about how to do that. You all were talking briefly about that. How many reports are out there? How do we make those connections? Who would pull those together? Um, I think those are the right questions to be asking um, because we do want a comprehensive picture to think forward and make decisions about what will we change? Is it the exclusionary practice pre-K-3? Is that the right next step? Maybe, um, but I think thinking about the context of all the information that's been collected in the state on these topics and then thinking about that would make good sense. Um, and then I also, in, in, in closing, I would just offer um, an important conversation to be had about what happens for students in schools when the, the plans don't work and they become highly dysregulated and need to regulate in ways that take them away from a space of their learning circumstance and need to regulate and return and to, to see that differently than discipline. And so there's a nuance there that I think is just important to note. And I'm not really sure how to handle that. Maybe it's within the context of definition and being really clear about that and what is and is not a removal versus what is or is not actually a strategy to help a student regulate. Taking proactive breaks from learning environments that can be overwhelming can be a very helpful tool for some students, particularly our youngest learners who really need to move and um, maybe have some other opportunities opportunities for deeper relationship than being in a, gr a large group at some times. So I just want to make sure that as we have these conversations, we recognize the complexity of student needs and the difference between exclusion and support. So I'll leave it there and offer an opportunity for questions. I really appreciate you having me. That was terrific. Uh, no, thanks for joining us. Uh, questions? Senator Hooker. Just a comment that um, a lot of what you're talking about, Erin, I think is in practice in some schools. I know that when I was teaching, um, it, there was a, a problem in the classroom, especially with um, kids with special needs. Uh, they were often given a break 
taken, um, you know, removed from the situation that was uh, that they were in for just a little while and then brought back. So I'm I'm interested in hearing you talk about this as uh, not discipline, not yeah. a discipline, not a disciplinary action. So that that sounds like an interesting idea to me. Thank you. I I appreciate that. And I think the definition of what is and is not removal becomes important in that context. So as we look at our data, it just gives you evidence of how complicated it is to collect this kind of data. What is a removal versus what is a support? How do we know that? And how are we reporting that? And are we reporting it consistently or not? Um, it's just an example of how, how I think sometimes the data ends up um, challenging to collect and be confident in? Is it about the amount of time that they're gone? Is it whether or not it's in their plan or not? Um, is it whether they're on a plan or not? And so, you know, who is that available to and who isn't it available to? So I do, I do think um, making sure that whatever we do, we are thoughtful about what we consider a removal versus a support. And when it is a removal, making sure we're clear about when can you remove a student from education and why, um, and what is our obligation to provide education even when it isn't safe to be present? And how do we think about that? Great. Other questions or comments? Uh, Ms. McGuire, I hope you'll continue to follow our work on this uh, and look forward to partnering with you on this and I'm sure other issues going forward. If, if at any time you notice there's something on our calendar that you would like to weigh in on and have not received an invitation, please just uh, simply reach out to us and we'll make certain that you are um, you were there. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. It was good to see many of you that I know. Nice to meet those of you that I do not. And I look forward to future work with you. Thank you. Great.